I want to talk about the developer tools that we're going to use and the the, the, the environment that you need to have available you, to you to do the web programming that we're going to do. So I'm going to run through a bunch of the tools that I'm going to use regularly and that I want you to have installed on your own machine. So take some time this week. If you haven't already got a proper web development environment set up, you need to do that. Now, if you have set up your laptop or your home machine previously to be able to do web programming, I still want you to go and make sure that everything is up to date. So the web has a very quick update cycle. Every six weeks, there's a new version of most browsers that get shipped. Things are constantly being redeployed. Code is being updated all the time in GitHub. And as a result, things get out of date. So if you installed things three months ago, four months ago, eight months ago, a year ago, they're out of date. You're gonna to need to install them again. Another thing I'll say is that whatever versions I'm talking about as I show you right now, by the time you watch this video, versions will have changed. So go and check out and make sure that you're using the latest um, version of whatever it is, whatever tool that you should be working with. Okay, so the first thing I wanna say is that I know that many of you are on Windows. And so I wanna say from the outset that the web is fundamentally uh, a Unix technology. You're going to find that so many, so many tools, so many assumptions, so many of the ways that we work are, are they're going to they're going to be uh, built on ideas that are inherent to Unix or at least to POSIX, the 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 standard for Unix file systems and the way that Unix systems are built. So, do you have to have a Unix computer in order to do web programming? You don't. You can do things on Windows. You can, you know, you can make that work. But there are some things you can do to improve your life. And I spend a lot of time helping students debug issues that are specific to Windows that wouldn't happen if they were on, quote unquote, a real operating system. Now, when I say that, I don't want to imply that you can't do things or shouldn't do things on Windows. You should. You should use every operating system that you can. I'm, I'm doing this on a Mac. I use every operating system, but my preference is to work on a Mac because a Mac is a Unix operating system. If you're on Linux, that's, that'll work too. The nice thing is that Microsoft has acknowledged this and it's pretty easy to turn a Windows machine into a Unix computer the same way that a Mac can be turned into a Unix computer by having um, an underlying subsystem that implements the POSIX, the pieces of the POSIX system that we need. Okay, so if you're on Windows, what I would encourage you to do is to go and set up the Windows subsystem for Linux or WSL. And there is a new version of WSL, WSL2. And what you can do is you can set it up and it will essentially run a VM. It'll run like a, you'll have two operating systems or two kernels running at once inside your Windows machine. You'll have a Linux kernel and you'll also have your Windows kernel. So you can be in Windows and be comfortable with Windows as a user, but whenever you need to drop down into something that supports all the different developer tools that we're gonna use, or the server software that we're gonna use, you can be doing it inside of a, you know, using a Linux kernel and using a Unix environment. So once you have WSL2 installed, you can install a, a distribution of uh, Linux. So for example, Ubuntu is a very popular one. So you can go to the Microsoft store and you can install Ubuntu. So once upon a time, there was this idea that it wasn't even an idea. It was true that Microsoft was against Linux, that they were against open source. They were against the open web. And, and you know, there was a lot of truth to that. There was big problems uh, early on with the web and the way that Windows was being managed. But today, uh, Unix has won. Unix is in every smartphone, it's in every operating, like every computer is capable of running Unix now and every computer is capable of running the web. So a Windows machine can be turned into a more powerful developer machine by adding uh, the Windows subsystem for Linux or WSL2 and being able to run uh, Ubuntu or another one of these Unix operating systems right inside of your Windows machine. So if you haven't done this, I would highly encourage you to spend some time and get that set up and read about it and learn how it works. Because for all of the courses that you have to do, anytime you have to make a decision, I want to use a tool, but I'm in Windows. Oh, I can't use this tool because this tool only, you know, it's a server 
tool or it's a compiler or whatever and it only works in Unix, well, now it works in your Windows computer. And that's why a lot of developers use Macs or have used Macs because Macs have a really beautiful front end, just like you're used to using the Windows GUI. But underneath, you've got a full Unix machine that can run all of the tooling that you need to do. Okay, the next thing that I want to encourage you to do is get a proper terminal. So I'm going to use iTerm2 on a Mac. And if you're on Windows, I would encourage you to go to the store and install the Windows terminal. What terminal will let you do is it will let you run things like It'll let you run various shells. So cmd.exe, PowerShell, Bash shell. You can run all of these different shells, but it will do things to support those shells. So the way that the, the rendering happens, the way that fonts are supported, the way that URLs and so on interact with the system, copying, pasting. Don't use the built-in crappy shell uh, terminals that come with Windows. Use the one that they are, like this is from Microsoft as well. They're developing it and you can install it. It doesn't come installed automatically. So you should get that in there for Unicode support, UTF-8, etc. That's really important. Okay, so you get a proper operating system set up and you need, you know, a terminal, I'm gonna do almost all of my work in the terminal. And if you're not comfortable in the terminal, I want you to be, I want you to push yourself a little bit to learn to use these tools. There's a reason why people who've been programming a long time use the terminal, and it's because it's faster. It allows you to automate things. It works in so many different environments. The GUI tools are easy to learn, but they're hard to use. And terminal, approaches to doing things, command line approaches to doing things, harder to learn, easier to use once you understand them. That may seem like a paradox, but give it a try. Don't get set in your ways and say, well, the only way I know how to do things is if I can click on a button. Well, yeah, I know that's easier at the beginning, but I want you to learn to develop some of these skills. I want you to learn to become comfortable using the command line. We're gonna do it with Node and NPM, and we're gonna do almost everything from the command line. Okay, you need a proper editor. And so probably, especially if you've been with me in the past, you'll know that I'm gonna recommend that you use Visual Studio Code. So I'm not talking about Visual Studio. Visual Studio is great if you're doing C++ development on Windows, but that's not what we're doing. We want an editor that is built for web development. Visual Studio Code is built for the web and it has tremendous plugins that we can add, extensions that we can add that make it easier to do lots of things that we're gonna do for the development work that we're gonna be working on. Now, as an aside, I also wanted to mention the fact I have, um, I have an instance of Visual Studio Code running here, but you'll notice that I have the uh, Chrome dev tools down here at the bottom. And I wanted to point out to you that this Thing that you've been using, Visual Studio Code, is a web page. So everything in here is, is the web. So like, for example, if I were to um, go and find, like here's my index.html um, entry in the uh, file section of my project, you'll see that over here it's a span. It's a span and I can, you know, put use regular CSS. So I could say, for example, make this red. And now you can see that the text of this is red. So Visual Studio Code understands the web because it is the web. So what they've done is they've, they have hosted a, a really complex web app, which is like the kind of thing we're gonna be building, building web apps as opposed to web, like this doesn't look like a website, does it? But this is just a web page. Now I don't have a URL bar and I don't have tabs and I don't have favorites. I don't have a back button but I have everything else. I have this rendered box and I'm able to, in this case, I'm working with Electron. Electron is like the Chrome browser that lets you run uh, web apps as desktop applications. So I wanted, to, I wanted to bring that up because Visual Studio Code is for and of the web. Like it is a, it is a true web technology. It's a, great, uh, it's a great technology because they use the web in order to build something that lets you develop the web. So it's great. So Visual Studio Code lets you install extensions and there are a whole bunch of extensions that you can install, but some of the ones that I want to encourage you to install, the first one is ESLint. So 
So I'm going to talk a lot about ESLint as I'm giving you different projects to work on. And you, if you're working on big web apps, you're going to see people working with ESLint. It's very, very difficult to write JavaScript or TypeScript, which we're going to be doing both. It's difficult to write them without a linter because there are ambiguities in the language. There are situations where, as a developer, you need tools to be able to guide you to write code that is correct. And so ESLint is going to help you by finding places where you make mistakes and allowing you visually to see, OK, this variable is never used. This function is never called. This is, this is imported, but it's never used inside the file, those sorts of things. So I want you to install ESLint inside Visual Studio Code. Another one that I want you to get used to is Prettier. And if you've worked on some of the assignments I've done in Web 222 in the past, I use Prettier all the time. Prettier allows you to take any valid JavaScript, JSON, HTML, CSS, and format it properly. So I don't want to read your unformatted crappy code. Please don't submit it to me. I am only interested in reading readable code, and there's no excuse anymore. It used to be that, you know, sometimes people be like, well, students, they haven't learned how to do this yet. There is, there is zero excuse. I want you to install a tool, let the tool do it for you every time it saves. So you can, there's instructions in here on how to set this up. If you read down and look, it'll tell you how to configure it. So you can have it so that every time you save your code, it'll automatically format everything. You don't have to do it anymore on your own. This is what I would recommend that you do. Same with tests. When you submit a test to me, I don't want your code to be uh, not properly indented. You need to be a professional developer. You need to write your code so it's readable. Okay, a third one that I would recommend, if you're like me, I make spelling mistakes all the time and I need a spell checker. So if I was writing an email or I was writing something in Word, I would use a spell checker. But then when you get into working with code, it's really tricky because how do you do a spell checker when you're writing code? Because there's like every word isn't in the dictionary. So the way that this works is it knows what is a comment or what is a variable name and it does spell checking on those things. So it's not going to get stumped by all of the programming things that are in here, but anything that is a is a, um you know like here ts merge or you know something is spelled incorrectly it will underline it in green and you can say oh yeah i need to i need to fix the spelling of this very very powerful so i want again i want your code to be readable i want it to be maintainable i want it to be understandable and and part of that is it has to be properly formatted you need to have proper spelling uh you need to take care of this code you need to not have dead code you need to not have variables that you're not using you need to not be missing semicolons, all that stuff. So if you install ESLint, Prettier, and the uh, Code Spell Checker, it's, it's going to go a long way to improving the quality of your code. And let's be honest, people are going to judge you based on the, on the quality of your code. If you go to an interview and somebody looks at your code and it's not formatted and it's full of spelling mistakes, and it's full of variables that don't make sense and functions that aren't being called properly. Like, that's a mess. And that's going to look poorly when you're trying to present yourself as a professional developer. So I want to get you used to writing code that's, you know, of a high quality. Okay, what else should we talk about? Node.js. Okay, so you're in a course 422 where we're talking about front-end web development. And I'm talking to you about Node.js. 322, I thought that was the note, the course for Node.js. It turns out that every, every time you do any web development work, we use Node. We use Node to manage dependencies. We use Node to install tools. We use Node to run scripts. We use Node to compile or transpile our code. We use Node to bundle our applications, web applications. So, so much of it is done using Node. So you need to have Node installed on your machine. Now, when I'm recording this, the current versions of Node, there are two of them. There's always two versions of Node. There's an LTS version of Node, and there's a current version of Node. I would caution you against using the current. Like, it sounds odd. So what I would recommend that you do is you use the LTS version. What does it stand for? It's not latest. LTS stands for long-term support. So let me show you how Node works. Essentially what happens is, they are constantly developing Node, and they're fixing bugs, they're adding features, they're changing APIs, and they're constantly shipping this 
latest and greatest version of Node. So that's the current version of Node. Then what they do is as they as they uh, as time goes on, they um, start having these older versions of Node, like 10, 12, 14, 15, etc. And so what these are, these are the um, the version of Node that they aren't going to break. Like they're not going to change an API or they're not going to suddenly have your code so it no longer works. And you can see that these things will be maintained for a long time. Like Node 14 is going to be maintained until January 2023. So that's great. So it's going to go into maintenance mode for a long time. You can see that node version 12 is going to be running out in 2022. Node version 10 is going to be running out in April. So if you're still on node version 10, node 10 still works and it's still supported, but it's in maintenance mode. It's not getting new features. The APIs aren't changing. You might say to yourself, well, don't I want new APIs and don't I want the latest thing? Not necessarily. When you ship software, you don't necessarily want to be on the latest cutting edge version of something because you don't want to have to deal with your code breaking all the time because Node is making changes or React is making changes or Angular is making changes. You want to get on some kind of a stable version. So your life will be much, much better if you stick to something stable. So if you jump on to Node 14 right now, which is what I would do, it's going to go on for a long, long time, January 2023. You can use 15.2 if you want, that's fine. Like you could use, and there's even newer ones that are out, but they're not there. So when you're looking at these versions, I tend to use an LTS version. That's what I would, I would suggest. They just released security fixes for all of the versions. So you can see that 14, 12, 10, they all got the same security fixes. So any of these LTS versions, they're still being maintained. They're still going to get updates, regular updates, in order to make sure that they, they don't break. But another thing about the way that node versioning works, when you see these version numbers changing, like when you go from version 14 to, to version 15, there can be a lot of breaking changes in there. So when a major version gets updated like that, well, then they can do things like delete old APIs that they don't want to use anymore, add new APIs, change them. And so things can break. So you got to really be careful when you jump around. But if I take 14.15.4.5.6.7, those are just <clears throat> dot updates, dot releases. I'm not worried about it breaking my code because they're doing security fixes and so on. Okay, so the main reason that we want to have Node for what we're going to do is because of this amazing thing here. This is NPM. And you've probably been using NPM a bit to install things like Express or Mongoose or other things that you were doing for server-side code. But we're also going to be using NPM to install all of our front-end tooling. So like, for example, if I want to work with React, React is something that I install through NPM. So it's a client-side technology as opposed to a server-side technology, but it's a JavaScript tool that I install through NPM. We're going to use uh, NPM to install all kinds of tools, frameworks, uh, platforms, etc., command line tools. And so we'll use NPM all the time. So you need to have um, an updated version of Node and you need to have an updated version of NPM. And we need to know how to work with both of those to do the work that we're going to do. OK, we're talking about working on browsers, we're talking about working on the web, you're going to need to install every browser that you can. So on my machine, I have Chrome, Firefox, Opera, Safari, Brave, Edge, I have, and then I have other um, browsers that you haven't heard of before. I have command line versions of browsers like Lynx. So any, any browser that you can get is good for you to get because when you're writing client side browser code, you're never going to run, you're going to write the code on your computer and it's never going to run on your computer. It's going to run on everybody else's computer. It's going to run on their phone. It's going to run on an Android phone. It's going to run on an iOS phone. It's going to run on some old version of Firefox or some old version of Safari. And it has to work, it has to work everywhere. So for you, what you really want to be able to do is test your code in as many different environments as possible. What you can't do is write it once on your computer, on your laptop, using Chrome or using Edge and think, okay, I'm done. If it works on my computer, then we're good to go. 
that's not how the web works. The web is full of all these little edge cases. Different browsers do things differently. Each browser has its own bugs or it has its own quirks and it's frustrating. So because the web isn't controlled by a single company, it means that there isn't one definitive version of the web. The web is this, I don't know, it's sort of a, a contract between a whole bunch of different companies and technology providers. So you have to test as much as you can. Um, depending on which computer you're on, you're gonna be able to get certain, um, certain browsers and not others. Like for example, Safari is not available for Windows. So you won't be able to install Safari, but if you have access to an iOS device like an iPad or an iPhone, then you can try testing with it. Microsoft has done a good job. They've made Edge available for all different operating systems. So you can get that Chrome and Firefox are obviously available, Opera. So at a minimum, I want you to be testing in Chrome and Firefox, Safari. Those are the ones that if you can, that you really want to be working on because it's important that you be able to test those to see how it's working. You should be testing what you write on a desktop, but also on mobile devices. So if you have access to a phone or different people in your household and you can try out what you're doing on different, the more devices and the more screen sizes and the more browsers you can test against, the better, because you want your code to work everywhere. Think about something like, uh, in a previous video, I was talking about something like Netflix. If you open up Netflix, you expect it to work. If you open it up on your Xbox or you open it up on your phone or on your desktop computer, you don't care that you're in a completely different environment. You're just using the web. And the web is expected to work everywhere the same way. But for that to be true, you've got to test it. And there's lots of tricks and things that we have to do to, to write code so that it can be uh, maximally supported across all different systems that we're working on. Okay, so we talked about NPM. Let's talk about working with backend uh, APIs. So in the course, they refer a lot to Postman. Postman is a neat tool for being able to visually work against um, REST APIs. So being able to send queries to uh, different systems. I'll let you uh, download this and play with it on your own. I don't tend to use Postman a lot because I prefer command line tools. So in addition to Postman, I would also encourage you to install this, which is, is curl. Curl is a command line tool that allows you to work with URLs. So if I want to interact with a uh, JSON API or some kind of an, a server-based API, which we're going to be doing a lot of, it's really easy to work with curl at the command line and test things out without having to write any code. So this is uh, great because curl works on every operating system. It's one of the most widely installed pieces of code in the world. You can get it for Windows, you can get it for Mac, you can get it for Linux. It may already be installed. If it's not installed, you should install it. You should download it and install it on your machine so that you have access to it. Uh, what else should we, what should I mention? I guess another one that I wanna mention is Git. So in this course, I'm not gonna teach Git, which is unfortunate. I love Git. Git is, is my, one of my favorite tools and I spend a lot of time teaching Git in the open source courses that I teach. So I don't have time to teach you Git in this course. However, I know that some of you have already started to dabble with it. I would encourage you to get Git installed on your machine and begin to learn to use it. You don't have to be an expert. I'm going to be using Git a lot. I'll put my code, all of my code that I write, I'll put it in Git. So if you want to access it, you can you can get it yourself. So part of becoming comfortable with this is, is just playing with it and getting it installed and making sure you have it on your machine and you're ready to go. There are other tools that we're going to use. Um, so for example, when we start doing React, we'll use the React Dev Tools or Angular, the Angular um, CLI tools. There's so as we go, we will install more and more tooling and we're gonna to install tons of modules. Uh, even in the examples that I do this week, I'm gonna talk a bit about how all of that works. So I want you to get familiar with how Node and NPM work for doing front-end development, for doing testing, for doing uh, bundling and all of transpiling code, all of the things that we're gonna be doing across the different systems that we're working on. So do yourself a favor, go through all of your tools, and update everything that is out of date, install anything that you're missing, read the documentation. This is a lighter week for most of you, like your first week back, you're not gonna have uh, as many things as you will in the final week of the course. Take some time, 
to dig into some of these tools. If you've never installed some of them or you've never really figured out how they work, get a proper development environment set up. Make sure that your machine is going to be your friend rather than your enemy. Anything that hasn't been working well, you should deal with that right now and make sure that you're in uh, good shape for being able to uh, do the kinds of work that we're gonna do. Okay, I'll pause it there and I will see you in the follow-up videos.